Good evening and welcome, bonjour and bienvenue tout le monde. My name is Riley Brockington and I am a trustee with the Ottawa Public Library Board and City Councillor for Riverward. And I'm very happy to welcome you to tonight's important conversation. We believe it is important to acknowledge that even as we gather virtually, we are on the unceded and ancestral territories of the Anishinaabe Algonquin First Nations people. I would like to thank our partner in organizing this event, the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Climate change is the ultimate challenge of our times, and I'm very pleased that the Ottawa Public Library will once again host an important and timely author event that can help shape public discourse on a crucial matter. This is also a good reminder of the power of books to educate and to provide us with the tools to make informed decisions. Renowned climate scientist, Michael E. Mann is with us tonight to discuss his new book, The New Climate War, The Fight to Take Back Our Planet. I look forward to hearing his advice on tackling this major crisis. For another well-timed book talk on the subject, join us next week on Monday, April 19th, at the same time as Seth Klein will be here to talk about his new book, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. And remember, you can visit the Ottawa Public Library website anytime to find out about other exciting programs, as well to access varied and excellent library resources on time, excuse me, online, anytime. It is now my pleasure to introduce Sean Wilson from the Ottawa International Writers Festival to say a few words as well. Thank you and have a great evening. Merci et bonne soirée. Thank you, Councillor. Good evening, everyone. I am also broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe, and I'm thrilled to welcome you all to the Writers' Festival's 2021 virtual season, and to thank our friends at the Ottawa Public Library for their ongoing collaboration. I also want to thank you for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street, but I know that wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you some great books. Our spring season continues into June and it's all available online free and on demand at writersfestival.org. If you enjoy this event or any of our virtual programming, please consider making a charitable donation. Your financial support will allow us to continue to bring you the world's most interesting authors and thinkers, even as we enter year two of the pandemic. Tonight, we're turning our attention to the climate emergency, and I'm thrilled to introduce our host. Zipporah Berman has been designing environmental campaigns and working on environmental policy in Canada and beyond for over 20 years. She's currently the International Program Director at Stand.Earth and the Chair of the Fossil Fuel Non-Proliferation Treaty Initiative. She's an adjunct professor of York University's Faculty of Environmental Studies and works as a strategic advisor to a number of First Nations environmental organizations and philanthropic foundations on climate and energy issues. Her accolades and accomplishments on behalf of the environmental movement are far too numerous to detail tonight, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention her fantastic book, This Crazy Time, Living Our Environmental Challenge, which was featured at the festival back in 2016, I think, in those dimly remembered days when we could gather in person to celebrate great books and discuss big ideas. Here we are virtually, so please, Join me in a warm virtual welcome to our host this evening, Zipporah Berman. Thank you so much. And thank you to the um, Ottawa Public Library and the Ottawa International Writers Festival for hosting this event. I am so excited to be hosting this event. I'm here um, on the unceded uh, territories of the Clahous First Nations on a small island in Northern British Columbia. Um, and I, you know, I spent the weekend with Michael Mann's book. And I have so many questions, it could take up hours and they're already uh, flowing in online. As we start this discussion, you're gonna have questions too. So join us by putting them in the Q&A function at the bottom of this Zoom, or if you're on Facebook Live, on putting them into Facebook Live and by some magic, they'll transfer over to Michael and I. So um, of course, uh, you know, I think Michael uh, needs uh, probably very little introduction to this audience, um, but, I will say um, that I have been inspired 
uh, by um, Professor Mann's uh, resilience, his dedication, and his persistence over the last many decades on these issues. I think many people know here, of course, that he is a distinguished professor of atmospheric science and the director of the Earth Science System Science Center at Penn State. For decades, his work has contributed to the scientific understanding of historic climate change based on the temperature record of the past thousand years. He's the author of more than 200 uh, peer reviewed and edited publications and five books, the most recent of which, The New Climate War, we're here to talk about today. So without, with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Michael Mann. Thanks so much, uh, Zabora. It's great to be with uh, here with you. Um, I want to thank the Ottawa Public Library for hosting this event. Um, uh, it is an interesting time to be talking about this challenge, and I am looking forward to having this conversation with you, my friend. Fantastic. Um, so, you know, I want to I want to start uh, this conversation um, with an area in the book that actually surprised me, um, which is about optimism. <laughs> And you know, despite the attacks, the critics, the deniers, the doomsayers, you have steadfastly maintained that the science shows us we need to take action. And that if we do that, if we can mitigate the worst impacts of climate change, I, you know, I needed to hear that after over two decades of this work. And I expect we all do. So, so tell us, you know, the guy who brought us the hockey stick, you know, why are you so enthusiastic these days? where are you seeing encouragement? Yeah, and I'm not sure enthusiasm is the quite the right word to characterize my feelings, um, but certainly cautious optimism, uh, cautious optimism that we have arrived at an important moment. Um, and as you allude to, uh, I have been sort of working um, in this area now for more than a, a couple decades. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, originally uh, my forays were purely scientific ones, um, I investigating the underlying science of climate change, but my work led me into the very center of the contentious societal political battle over climate change and what to do about it. And ultimately I've embraced that, that role uh, to play, um, you know, that opportunity to play a role uh, in, you know, this conversation about what is arguably the greatest challenge that we face. And the optimism that I have today um, comes from a few places. Um, first of all, the youth climate movement um, and the social movements that are playing out today in the domain of, of racial justice and social justice and, and the intersection with fundamental issues about climate justice. Uh, I feel like we're going through a tipping point moment and it, it's a good tipping point, not the bad tipping points that we fear, the climate tipping points uh, the collapse of the ice shelves and the ice sheets. We do worry uh, about those bad tipping points, but we hope for tipping points of the good kind, uh, a, 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 a fundamental shift in our consciousness about this issue. And I feel like we're going through that now. And I, I feel like that's also intersected with a, a favorable shift in the political winds, uh, certainly here in the United States, where we've seen that elections do have consequences. One election, means the difference between a president who unilaterally pulled out of the Paris Agreement, making the United States the only country to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, the difference between that president and a president who has come forward with uh, what I would argue is the boldest agenda, first hundred days agenda that we've yet seen from an American president when it comes to climate change. So we've got all these developments. We've got a favorable shift in the political winds. We have social movements that are playing out um, and lend themselves to a greater consciousness about the climate crisis. Um, there is great urgency, as I like to say, there's no question about that. We're seeing the catastrophic impacts of climate change play out in real time now. There's great urgency, but there is agency. There is still an opportunity to do something before it's too late. Let's talk about the science for a minute because we hear a lot about how um, there's there there's so many emissions already baked in, you know, because of uh, emissions from the past. They're already in the pipeline. Um, what does the science say? Yeah, so you know there have been some important developments over the last ten years or so in how we think about this problem, and it has to do in part with the fact that we can do more sophisticated experiments than we used to do. So in the old days. 
with the climate modeling experiments, we would treat carbon dioxide levels as, as if they're a simple control knob and you just turn it up and then you let the climate respond to that. And if you do it that way, what you find out is that when you stop turning up the knob, the warming still persists for several decades. And that's because the greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere um, are warm in the ocean, that, that warmth is slowly penetrating down into the deep ocean. So there's this delay factor that leads to decades of additional warming, even after you stop turning the dial up. Well, we now understand that that's a flawed way of thinking about the problem because we don't have our hands on the carbon dioxide dial. What we're doing instead is putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and the climate system itself determines what happens to that carbon dioxide. And nearly half of it actually comes back out of the atmosphere. It's absorbed by plants and vegetation on land and then an even larger amount of it um, by the oceans. So about half of the carbon pollution we've been putting into the atmosphere has actually been taken up. Um, and so the experiments we now do, we treat carbon emissions as an emission. We put it into the atmosphere, we let the climate model figure out what happens to it. And when you do it that way, what you find is when you stop emitting carbon into the atmosphere, CO2 levels actually slowly start to come down because the, the oceans in the terrestrial biosphere are absorbing some of that CO2 in the atmosphere and we're no longer putting CO2 into the atmosphere. So those CO2 levels start to drop. That offsets that other factor I talked about, which would cause warming for several decades. You basically have one factor that goes up, another that comes down. They basically cancel out and you get a flat line. And so when you stop putting carbon into the atmosphere, the surface of the planet stops warming in a few years. That's the reason that we can define what we call a carbon budget. We now know that there's a certain amount of carbon that we can burn and keep surface temperatures below a given level. This whole concept of a carbon budget, how much carbon there is left to burn if we're to uh, avoid crossing some of these dangerous limits like one and a half degrees Celsius, which we'd really like to keep under. We, we now understand that we can define these budgets. And when you work out the numbers, they tell us that, again, there's urgency. We've got to bring carbon emissions down by a factor of two within 10 years. That's a monumental challenge. But if we can do that, mm -hmm. we can stop the further warming of the planet. We can avoid crossing into that dangerous zone of more than one and a half degrees. It doesn't mean some bad things aren't going to happen. We're already seeing some bad things happen, but we can avert the worst impacts. I think one of the critical things that you just said there, which you talk a lot about it in your book when you talk about some of the false solutions, et cetera, is that is, is, is reducing overall emissions and how much we need to reduce overall emissions now to get to that point. So there's optimism there. If we get to that point, um, uh, uh, you know, we, we still have a chance which is what I, I notice when I do a lot of my speeches, that's what young people always say to me. Do we have a chance? Do we still have a chance? Um, and, I, and so I think there's, that's exciting, the optimism there, but the challenge that we're facing right now to reduce overall emissions uh, is of course significant. Um, and you know, it's not in Canada, I don't know if you know, but our national inventory report was just filed um, uh, with the UN. Uh, our emissions went up a million tons in 2019, not down. Um, and you know, we, we, we are, we've now had seven climate plans, I think, um, in, in our history. This one's a good one in lots of ways. You talk in your book a lot about the importance of putting a price on pollution, which yeah. we now yeah. have nationally. Um, but that in itself isn't enough. Uh, I, I really appreciate it in your book when you were talking about needing both supply and demand right, uh, right. side policies, that it's not one, that it's, you know, that it's not one thing. So give us a sense, especially for people who are not climate policy geeks, like what needs to happen? What are the concrete changes um, that we need to do to get us there? And what are some of the things that you've seen Biden do or other countries do that you think are like, ah, this is this is what starts to bend the curve? Yeah, no, so you're right. I mean, you're touching on, uh, you know, the, the crucial, there are different crucial aspects of the problem. There's how much carbon we're burning to generate energy for transportation, et cetera. And, you know, uh, Canada has put in place, um, you know, carbon pricing mechanisms to try to lower those emissions, but there's also the production. And the fact is that Canada is a major exporter 
of fossil fuels. And so just because Canadians aren't burning those fossil fuels doesn't mean that Canada isn't contributing to our overall use of and burning of fossil fuels. Similar story with Australia, one of the largest exporters of, of, um, of fossil fuels. And so you really do have to look at both sides of that. What are we producing? What are we consuming? And what measures do we have in place to attack the problem on both sides. And so, you know, carbon pricing or subsidies for renewables, um, uh, th these are uh, potentially very effective ways of decreasing demand, but we've also got to decrease the supply. And that's where issues like the Keystone XL pipeline and the, you know, Athabasca tar sands, um, as long as we continue to mine uh, these very carbon intensive fossil fuels, um, and we build infrastructure to allow for the distribution and sale worldwide of those fossil fuels, we're going to continue to contribute to this problem. Where I have some optimism with the Biden administration is um, more than any other administration in, in the past, and there aren't that many to compare with because really um, only under Obama did we start to see some, some significant climate action. And even that was somewhat limited and there were political constraints um, that uh, Obama had to deal with in a Republican Congress that refused to, to pass any legislation that might uh, assist the executive actions that the administration was taking. Um, here, Biden has a little bit more leeway. Democrats control um, the con uh, Congress now, but they can't allow any of their caucus to stray. Um, they can't lose any um, Democrats if they are to pass climate legislation. And if, and if they are to do it, it's gonna have to be through so-called reconciliation. And there are all sorts of limitations on what you can do there. Um, but what I like about the Biden approach is that um, there is a recognition that we have to use all of the tools in the toolbox on the demand side, on the supply side, we've got to stop providing you know, subsidies to the fossil fuel industry, we've got to stop allowing them to drill on public lands. And so they're, they're addressing some of these supply side issues, um, no, not green lighting the Keystone XL pipeline. Biden has said that um, he will uh, end the pipeline, but also looking at you know, providing stimulus subsidies for uh, renewable energy, uh, looking at frontline communities and making sure that they're not uh, adversely impacted by um, you know, any uh, carbon pricing that we do um, to make sure that um, what we do is, is just, that there is, it, it's consistent with climate justice if we are going to you know, put a price on carbon of some sort. So I, I think it's the broadest uh, by far uh, agenda that we've seen of an American president. And it comes at, at, you know, just in the nick of time, just when we need it. Um, this upcoming climate summit in, uh, in uh, December, November um, in uh, Glasgow, the next major conference of the parties, COP26. This is sort of, you know, it's getting, we're late in the fourth quarter when it comes to bringing carbon emissions down fast enough to avert catastrophic warming, more than one and a half Celsius warming. It's late in the fourth quarter. Um, Biden's got the ball. I'm going to use an American football analogy here, um, but he can't fumble it. He can't afford to fumble the ball or turn it over. Um, we've got to take it down the field. So one of the things that I loved in the book is that you really talk about um, what's holding us back and what's going to try what, you know, I, I think the forces that are also going to try and attempt to hold Biden back from carrying that ball down the field. I mean, I, I have the lived experience, like many people who are watching, of, of you know, over a decade of the Harper administration where we didn't move forward on climate policy. Um, you know, in fact, I think Harper was quoted in 2009, right after Kyoto, right after Copenhagen, saying that Kyoto was a socialist scheme just to suck money out of good people. You know, we were the first country to pull out of Kyoto. And then the Trudeau government, um, you know, Trudeau stood at Paris, heart over hand, hand over heart, you know, Canada is back, which is exciting and has played an important role. I think Canada's punched above its weight in Paris and other places yeah. um, in the in the climate negotiations. And yet we've seen a backpedaling on the conversation around phasing out oil and gas. Yeah. You know, we have a government that declared a climate emergency and literally in parliament 
and literally the next day bought the Trans Mountain Pipeline to expand the tar sands that you just talked about, and certainly to expand significant fossil fuel infrastructure at a price of between 12 and $20 billion of taxpayers' money. Right. This year, we just saw from the ISD uh, great reports on, on fossil fuel subsidies that they've done comparing various countries that, you know, Canada's increasing our fossil fuel subsidies over a billion dollars just to LNG and fracking uh, uh, alone, let alone buying the pipeline. Yeah. So yeah. It, often our politics are held hostage to the influence of the fossil fuel industry in a lot of insidious ways. So in, in, in your book, you talk a lot about um, the old climate war, denial and doubt and the new climate war, which is more about forces of, of, of delay, you know, the yeah. inactivists, I love that term, where and you talk about trying to, trying to dampen the enthusiasm for absolute uh, reductions. Yeah. So can you give us a, a little more a sense of, of, so what are some of the most uh, new tactics and how are they playing out in this, in this delay? Yeah, and then you put your, your uh... You, you, you know, you, 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 you really, you know, um, I, I think characterized it very nicely. Um, you know, it's all about delay because for every year of delay in transitioning off fossil fuels, these polluters are making billions of dollars profit. So at this point, it's simply a matter of them slowing down the process. They know the end game. They know that we're going to you know, that the, the age of fossil fuels is coming to an end, but they're going to try to extend it uh, as far out as they can. Um, most of their assets are still buried beneath the ground. Um, there's five times as much carbon, as you probably know, um, in proven assets beneath the ground as is necessary to warm the planet beyond two degrees Celsius. That means fossil fuel industry has to leave the vast majority, majority of their assets stranded. Um, they're going to do everything they can to monetize as much of those assets as they can. And that's what's happening right now. And so it's about delay and it's about distraction and deflection. It's no longer so much about denial, as you alluded to. That's sort of the old climate war was this war on the science, on the basic scientific evidence. And I found myself at the center of that war decades ago when we published the, the now famous hockey stick curve and it became a target and I became a target of the forces of inaction. Um, well, here's the thing, uh, a couple decades later now, um, you know, the, 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 the cost of inaction is such that climate change is no longer a theoretical construct. It's no longer an abstract notion. It's something that we're witnessing on our television screens, in our newspaper headlines, um, in our social media feeds. It's happening, the impacts are playing out. And so the forces of inaction, they know they can't deny that climate change is happening and, and they really can't deny that it's having an impact. But what they can do is try to, you know, use any other tactics that they can um, come up with to try to delay meaningful action, keep us addicted to fossil fuels for as long as they can. And so that involves, um, of course, just old fashioned delay, talking a good game, but meanwhile, lobbying to get subsidies um, and, and, and new infrastructure you know, built. And that's what we're seeing in Canada and we're still seeing it in the United States to an extent. Um, it's about deflection, deflecting attention away from the needed systemic changes, policies, big policies to decarbonize our civilization. They don't want that to happen. So instead they'd like to make it about individuals. They'd like to make you and me think that it's just about our individual behavior. And if we changed our behavior, that would solve the problem. Um, sure, we should do all those things that we can in our everyday lives that decrease our environmental impact, our carbon footprint. Why wouldn't we? These are things that make us feel better. They often save us money. They um, make us healthier. They set a good example for other people. We should do all those things, but they want the focus so thoroughly on individual action that we neglect the elephant in the room, which is policies to decarbonize our economy. And it isn't, for that reason, it isn't a you know, coincidence that the first 
well-known sort of popular carbon footprint calculator, individual carbon footprint calculator, came to us in the early 2000s via British Petroleum. Because British Petroleum and the fossil fuel companies wanted us so focused on our own carbon footprint that we failed to take note of theirs. 70% of our carbon emissions from 100 polluters, 100 large polluting companies. And so we have to keep the pressure on them. We can't allow them to deflect attention entirely to individual behavior. And unfortunately, a lot of media, uh, mainstream media outlets have really sort of um, bought into that framing. The New York Times has far more articles about the things that you can do uh, to change your lifestyle, to, to decrease your carbon footprint then you know the, the the policies the systemic stuff um, that we need there are other tactics as well false solutions uh, oh well we'll just um we'll capture the carbon and sequester it somewhere or we will engage in geoengineering we will interfere with the global climate system in some other way in some other unprecedented um uncontrolled way in the hope that we might somehow be able to offset the warming effect of carbon pollution. What could possibly go wrong? Um, and all of these prescriptions, by the way, are laid in, in what we call um, um, moral hazard, which is mm -hmm. to say, to the extent that fossil fuel companies can say, well, look, you know, we've got a solution. 10 years from now, we'll be able to suck all that carbon back out of the atmosphere or engage in these other geoengineering schemes. So, you know, don't worry too much about the carbon we're burning right now. And they've got people like Bill Gates who are actually making that argument for them. Uh, he's got a book that's uh, had wider circulation than my own um, that came out around the same time where he advocates such a, you know, very technocratic uh, path forward, neglecting the fact that the limitation here isn't technology. We've got the technology to decarbonize our civilization. The problem right now is political. It's the political willpower to actually do it. You know, it, I um, it seems to me when I was reading your book that I that there is always an element of truth in the in the false solutions, you know, or and and they and they play on everybody wants it to work. We want to have our cake and eat it too. You know, I've been sitting in meetings with the oil industry here in, in, in Canada or with yeah. government when they explain, you know, and you see the lights go on as soon as they start talking about CCS. Oh, we could, <laughs> we could decouple production and emissions. We could actually just reduce emissions and then we wouldn't have to stop producing, you know, in this, we can have our cake and eat it too conversation. And so I, I want to- And it's, it's earnest, right? There's some, it's an yeah. earnest sort of uh, response on their part, seemingly. Right. Like yeah, but really I, and I think there's a lot of people in industry um, who have kind of held on to that because of that. That you know, we we want to find a way to justify what we're currently doing because it's easier than the change that we see right. that has to happen. You don't want know? to think we're bad. <laughs> we think right. <laughs> but uh, so so let's talk a little bit more about how those false solutions are playing out in the current debate in the run up to COP with net zero. Yeah. So you know. I don't know, five years ago, if someone had told me that we were going to be having these intense conversations about net zero, where every bank, oil company, government was going to have to put forward their net zero plan, I would have done a happy dance. And yet today, the net zero conversation seems so distorted. And, and you know, oil companies are coming out with their net zero plan, which right. actually involves increasing the production of fossil fuels. And, and so it's kind of, you know, what you were saying about CCS yeah. playing out in real time in the yeah. real politics and the run up to COP26. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of very clever manipulation of language um, that we have to look out for here. Um, and, you know, the forces of inaction are very clever. They have focus groups and polling. Um, they know what language is effective. They've been studying it for decades. They're miles ahead of us. <laughs> you know, they've hired some of the um, top advertising executives, some of the top minds in the world of marketing have been working on their behalf for decades. So they're very good at manipulating language and getting well-meaning people to buy into their framing without realizing that they're doing their bidding, they're doing their agenda by adopting that preferred language. Um, and, uh, you know, um, clean energy rather than renewable energy. Look out for that distinction because wrapped up in clean energy is a potentially very large role for nuclear. 
that is lumped into clean um, in the parlance that we encounter these days. And I think there's some, you know, I, I don't think it's a mystery um, to uh, our listeners, um, our viewers, that um, that there are a lot of risks that come with, with nuclear energy. It's a risky strategy. If we downplay the role that renewable energy and efficiency and all these safe measures that experts tell us can get us to where we need to go, you know, you take Bill Gates and he downplays the role that renewable energy uh, can play. Um, and he does so by neglecting work by, you know, folks like Mark Jacobson of Stanford, uh, folks at Berkeley who've shown a path forward where we can get there um, through renewables. But, you know, people like Gates, they don't accept that. They downplay the role of renewables and that forces them then to find a riskier path towards, you know, climate mitigation which involves nuclear or geoengineering. Um, and so clean energy rather than renewable energy, well, that, that shift in language is to uh, allow for a larger role for nuclear. And we should be aware of that's why the, the language is being framed that way. Net zero, which your net zero is a very clever way of saying, well, we can put, continue to put carbon into the atmosphere if we can take it out just as fast or even faster. Now we know how to put carbon into the atmosphere really well. We're really good at doing that. We have proven technology for doing that. It's called fossil fuels. What we don't have is proven technology at that scale for taking it out of the atmosphere. And so it becomes a leap of faith to believe that we can take carbon out of the atmosphere as fast as we're putting it in, because that is what some of these strategies for net zero, as you're alluding to, that's how they get away with it. Well, we'll continue to emit carbon, but we're going to take it up through carbon capture and sequestration or direct air capture, we'll suck it back out of the atmosphere. That's easy enough to do. No, it isn't. It's really hard to do, really expensive to do. Right, and the, the expensive is the key point here in a lot of ways because it, it that's the element of truth. We, we can actually do direct air capture. It's kind of cool. I've been to the Squamish plant just here yeah. in British Columbia. We can do some carbon capture and storage, though it is dangerous um, in terms of the release of it. But sure, it's happening. It's at, not 100% a efficient scale. either. Yeah. But the scale that's being proposed in a yeah. lot of these country and company net zero plans like, look, let's let's take um, uh, land capture for a minute. We had a lot of questions online. I noticed about um, BEX. Um, what is BEX? And 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 you know, capturing um, carbon dioxide re removal through nature-based solutions. We hear a lot about that these days. And you know, protecting old-growth forests or protect or planting more forests, great. Seems like a good idea. But when I first found out that the what was being modeled in the IPCC reports. Yeah for Bex was an area twice the size of India planted with straw every year and then and then cut down and then and then we and then we burn it and then we capture it it's and really easy to do in a model <laughs> <laughs> well that's what i learned from your book i didn't realize when i heard about those models that we're not doing it right now yeah yeah i mean none of these things as you are saying have been done at the scale that they would have to be done to make a serious dent. And, you know, Bex isn't just a tasty German beer anymore. <laughs> it's um, biofuels uh, um, capture and uh, bio, bio bioenergy capture. And I forget now what it stands for, but you basically, you get energy out of it and you grab the carbon and you bury it. So it seems like you're getting something for free. You're generating energy. And not only aren't you generating carbon pollution, if it's organic material, material and you get all of the carbon, you, you capture all of it and you bury it, you're actually getting net carbon burial while generating energy. It sounds too good to be true. Theoretically, it isn't, but practically, it probably is. Right. And so then these strategies are being used to justify the continued expansion of fossil fuels. And what I find amazing about the whole fossil fuel conversation, which you explored in your book a little bit, is that the fossil fuel industry has made themselves um, in invisible in it. Like 80% of our emissions are from oil, gas and coal, three products. And, and yet you don't even find the words oil, gas or coal in the entire Paris Agreement. I know I sat there and searched for them and it was shocked to see that yeah. you couldn't actually. Yeah. So it's like they've, they've, um, they've made themselves invisible and their products invisible yeah. in, the, in, in the debate. <clears throat> but I want to get to a- before They don't I have a carbon to... footprint. It's just you and me. <laughs> That's what they want us to think. Yeah. 
So I want to I want to move to some audience questions soon, but there's a there's a kind of attention in some of this conversation, and I think you got to it a little bit around the Brown Summit, and we've talked a little bit around Trudeau. Yeah. Um, so the fossil fuel industry tries to exploit any division in 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 the movement to make us weaker. Yeah. And and you talked about the Brown Summit, and you know Brown has been an incredible um, advocate for climate action, put in place a lot of great policies in California. Yet he was criticized at the summit because he had been approving new oil and gas, new fracking, new new oil drilling. Trudeau has as well. And and you know I, you talked about the need to address both demand and supply. Um, but then also talked about how we need to make sure we're giving political space to those who are moving forward. I struggle with that because we're also should be watchdogs as a movement. Absolutely. And I think the supply side work and the need to constrain lock-in, both, both infrastructure lock-in of fossil fuels, but also political lock-in, this is a relatively new conversation in yeah. the climate policy world. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I confess uh, to buying into a little bit of real politic there, which is to say, you know, when you have somebody like uh, Jerry Brown, who really, you know, on the whole has been a real climate hero. I mean, he sort of kept kept us going during the Trump years where California was still leading the way. It was decreasing our carbon emissions. Um, it was negotiating directly with China when, when the U.S. government wouldn't. Um, and so you can criticize, and um, in, 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 in there's room for criticizing the fact that, you know, yeah, he was um, allowing for uh, continued um, natural gas um, pipelines in, in California. Uh, you can criticize him for that. What, what I was taken aback by was him being turned into a villain. You know, mm -hmm. like, no, the villains are the Rex Tillerson's and the, the Donald Trump's. Um, there is the danger of the good, you know, being the, the perfect, being the enemy of the good um, and recognizing, you know, that someone like uh, Jerry Brown does operate within constraints. Yes, he's a governor and yes, there's a Democratic supermajority, but he's just a state governor. He still lives in a, in, in a country that has federal laws and, and federal um, policies that he can't get around. So, so yeah, in the case of Jerry Brown, you know, I, I do see him ha as having, as being sort of, um, you know, a, a hero in the climate movement. And, and to see him portrayed as a villain was difficult for me because then what I worry about is what's the, if somebody like Jerry Brown, if, if, he, if he's getting negative reinforcement for what he's doing, what is, what's the signal that, that sends to other politicians who they know they're going to get it from the fossil fuel industry, you know? Yeah. We, we struggle with this in Canada, right? I mean, I certainly yeah. struggled with it during, yeah. the, during the last election. I, I do think it comes down to, you know, to a certain extent tone, you know, that, that you know, I, I, I've said myself, I support Trudeau's carbon price and a lot of what's in the climate plan. And it's not okay that we're continuing to expand yeah. oil and gas. In Canada, it's the fastest growing source of emissions from production alone. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the largest source of our emissions now, just from just the production emissions, the 20% of the barrel that that is that is burned here in the country. So it yeah. Um, okay, so let's let's segue into a, the another a bit of a sticky, another sticky issue, which is related um yeah. uh, around the Green New Deal. So sure. because it's I think there is um a lot of the yeah, a lot of the movement, the youth movement and the climate movement now that is um really connected to the front lines of the fossil fuel fight, the people who are the indigenous leaders standing up in front of new pipelines, new drilling, etc., um, are also um uh really critical of market systems, of capitalism as a way to solve this. Yeah. And you've been critical of some aspects of the Green New Deal and and Naomi Klein for including some you know, complex social policies within the Green New Deal that might slow down climate policy uh, progress. Um, yet you're also talking about systems change. So can you give us a little yeah. more on your thinking about that? Yeah, thanks. Because it is, it's it's really a, a nuanced conversation, um, and it, which is difficult to have in today's inflammatory atmosphere, social media, um, where things uh, it quickly spin out of control and people get into um, social media wars. And sometimes it's difficult to have these nuanced conversations um, about things like, uh, you know, uh, the, the duality of working within the system and changing the system, for, for example. And so with, you know, 
it's pretty obvious, I think, that Naomi Klein and 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 and, and others um, who are you know who who are very um, pessimistic about the possibility of you know achieving environmental sustainability in the context of an extractive market economy, global market economy. I understand where they're coming from. I myself am not convinced that a resource extraction based global market economy is consistent with a sustainable planet. So we have to have a converse and, and the pandemic has I think opened our eyes to just how unsustainable our world potentially is as we degrade natural systems, um, as we, you know, um, a microscopic virus has turned our world uh, upside down. We feel that vulnerability. We now, I think, feel that vulnerability in a way that perhaps we didn't before. And that's an opportunity to have that larger conversation about um, our values and what sort of system we want. That having been said, we've got to bring our carbon emissions down by a factor two within 10 years to avert a catastrophic one and a half Celsius, three degree Fahrenheit warming. So my feeling is we've got to use the tools that are available to us now in the system that exists to attack this problem, even as we try to change that system for the better. And so both can exist at the same time, but that's a nuanced argument. And in this very binary, you know, um, public discourse that we have today, where things often get simplified and, 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 and issues get balkanized and polarized, it's difficult to, to sometimes maintain that, that dual view of uh, how we go about addressing a problem like this one. Yes, absolutely. I'm looking at our clock and I'm gonna just um, turn to some of the questions um, okay. that we've, we've, we've got. I, I wanna keep talking to you about this. Well, and I will I keep my answers a little shorter because I know we're, yeah. <laughs> um, um, got a great question online um, on Twitter from Rafi. Um, my kids grew up to listening to his music. Hi, Rafi. Um, can you ask Michael if bio sequestration of carbon via healthy soils is a key strategy in the drawdown of atmospheric carbon? And why don't we hear more about that? Yeah, I, I love Rafi's music too. It's great to get a question from him. Uh, <clears throat> enjoy following him on, on Twitter. Uh, so yeah, you know, that's part of the solution. As I said before, um, you know, this is a problem where we need all of the, the, the tools in the toolbox, all of the real tools that we have. Um, and, you know, to an extent, um, there is something to be said for the idea of net zero, which is we've got to stop putting carbon into the atmosphere and we do want to take it out. And as you alluded to before, there are natural ways to do that that aren't, you know, messing with the earth system in an unprecedented way, in a dangerous way. So I get nervous about sort of the geoengineering and artificial approaches and, and, and all of the potential problems that come with that. But I think there is a role for natural carbon burial through reforestation, afforestation, and certainly let's stop deforestation at the very least. And regenerative agriculture um, and other means of uh, carbon burial, land use policies, um, agricultural policies that help us sequester carbon. All of that has to be on the table. Um, again, you know, I'm, I'm not a, a shill for the Biden administration, but I will uh, give them some kudos for recognizing that. And, and they do address policies um, regarding agriculture and, and land use. They, re they recognize that that's going to be an important part of the, the solution. We've got to stop putting carbon into the atmosphere and we've got to do what we can in a safe way to take it back out. Related question um, online about, are trees still the most effective technology for carbon capture? Well, you know, nature is pretty clever. You give it millions and billions of years and, um, and, it, um, and it, it can solve all sorts of uh, problems. Um, and so trees are really effective absorbers of carbon. Now, the problem is um, they do die um, and the organic matter, um, some of it, you know, decays, makes it back up into the atmosphere. 
Um, and certainly if it's burned, um, if it's oxidized, it makes it back into the atmosphere. So there is this idea that, well, maybe we can improve on trees. What we'll do is we will speed up the process. They use photosynthesis. We can come up with synthetic processes that work a lot faster than photosynthesis. They take CO2 out more efficiently. And unlike a tree, which leaves organic refuse around that can decay and make it back into the atmosphere, we'll take that carbon and we'll bury it deep. And that sort of underlies a lot of the direct air capture schemes that we read about. So of all of the geoengineering schemes that are out there, I, I do think that direct air capture is something that we probably do want to look at, but it's got to be done efficiently. We can't be, you know, if it takes as much energy to manufacture and deploy this stuff as, you know, um, you know, a, a, as it, it offsets from a fossil fuel burning standpoint, then it's not helping us. And so we've got to be sure that if you look at a full life cycle analysis, that it really is helping us in our efforts to bury carbon. And I know folks like uh, Mark Jacobson are, are skeptical. He, he's argued that if we put resources even into direct air capture, what we're doing is we're actually taking resources away that could have been put into renewable energy that doesn't generate any carbon pollution. And so it's a net loss. Um, I'm a bit, uh, uh, I, I guess I'm 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 still um, you know uh, open-minded about it. I'm 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 I think we should continue to investigate that possibility, but we we can't bank on it, and we can't allow it to be used as a crutch for polluters to say, okay, so we can still pollute now because we'll we'll do direct air capture ten years from now. Right. Um a lot of questions uh, online about LNG. In Canada, LNG is being promoted as a global climate solution, both by our prime minister and certainly here in this province where the largest, um, one of the largest LNG facilities in the world is um, currently planned to be built here, LNG Canada, with huge subsidies from the government. So can you talk about LNG as a solution um, yeah, to, to the climate problem? Yep, and I promised some short answers here. So here, here's a short one. The solution to a problem created by fossil fuels cannot be a fossil fuel, LNG or anything else. Well, you're right. That was a very short answer um, to a very good, yeah, <laughs> intense, intense problem, but it, it does make you feel like you're getting out of the- I think it really is that simple. Fire. I think it yeah. is that simple, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I think the fact that it's already, dis, it's, we're starting to see that it's actually displacing renewables. Um, it's, uh, exactly. as you note in your book, no longer a bridge if it ever was. Okay, a bunch of questions about you and resiliency. Um, from Jackie Mercer online, you're famous uh, for your hockey stick graph, which really drove home for a lot of people the real impact that humans were having on the climate. Um, how did that research and publication impact your career? Um, and tell us a bit about the notoriety that came along with that. And then previously on Twitter, I got a question. Um, is there something in your history that galvanized you to up your game and to be able to speak like this? What was the personal <laughs> experience that made you become more serious about becoming such a, a, a vocal force for good? Well, uh, thanks for, for the questions. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, when I double majored in applied math and physics as an undergraduate at UC Berkeley, I didn't think I was setting myself up for a career at the center of the most contentious political debate we've ever had on this planet. But um, that is where my work led me because of the hockey stick. It, it became sort of this iconic symbol in the climate change debate, and it thrust me into the center of the, the public arena. And as the second question sort of gets at, um, I recognized that I had an opportunity and I better not squander it. Um, whether I liked it or not, um, I had been thrust into the center of this fractious debate, and it's not what I had signed up for. Um, I love doing science. I love solving, you know, problems, uh, writing computer code to do calculations. This was the sort of stuff that I geeked out on in, in high school, and that's what I thought I was going to do, and that's what got me into science. Um, but when you know, our, 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 my science took on this larger dimension, I realized that I had an opportunity potentially to do something different, to do something greater, that um, I had an opportunity to inform this conversation about 
you know, what is arguably the greatest challenge that we faced as a civilization. That is a great privilege. I didn't want to squander that privilege. Um, and I realized that um, to make the most of it, I had to be effective at what I was doing. I understood that you have to be effective as a scientist to make it a career uh, in science, but you've got to be effective as a communicator if you're going to try to make a, a career in communicating science to the public. And I had role models to watch um, that I had um, looked up to when I was younger, never realizing that they might actually be literal role models, models for what I myself might want to or have to do. Um, and they were folks, um, you know, like, um, you yeah, talked I about mean, Carl, Carl Sagan Carl, a lot in the beginning Carl of the book. Carl Sagan, was... Carl Sagan, uh, but you know, you've got Jane Goodall, you've got um, these public figures in science um, who, uh, you know, who, who are great scientists, but they also recognize that there was an opportunity to do something greater, to do something, um, you know, that really speaks to the great challenges that we face. I had that opportunity. I didn't want to squander it. And so, you know, I worked at being as good as I can be at doing it. And, 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 it's, um, and I appreciate the kind comments from, from uh, the, the questioner, but um, yeah, you know, it's, it's an opportunity. I don't wanna squander it because the stakes couldn't be greater. We're literally talking about the future of our planet. There were a number of questions about the attacks on you, um, the personal attacks and that, um, <laughs> I remember reading in the book, you said Patrick Moore called you a, um, a death wish, a death wish cultist. <laughs> there was a moment of kin for me yeah. because oh, I yeah. was once on national news, Patrick Moore called me a whacked out nature worshiper who prays to the moon. <laughs> he needs to sit down. He needs to drink a glass of uh, Roundup and just calm down. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. That moment when, when, when he talked about how safe it was and then refused to drink it. That was a great brilliant story brilliant. In, yeah. in, in your book. But so, You've you've you face these attacks, yet you stay calm and positive to, despite it all. So the question is, you know, how how do you do this? Well, you know, I mean, the 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 attacks are so frequent, I barely notice them anymore. Really, it's, <laughs> it's a line from uh, I believe it's the Blues Brothers. Um, but no, I mean, how often do the trains come around? So often you barely even notice it, um, and sometimes it feels that way. Um, you do. It sort of just becomes background noise to you in a sense. And, you know, again, one of those role models, Steve Schneider, who's a great scientist and a great science communicator as well, and, uh, and sadly pa passed away um, some years ago, but, uh, but not before I had a chance to, to get to know him and to learn from him. And he said early on when I was starting to find myself subject to these attacks, you know, he said, understand, you know, that they wouldn't be going after you um, if what you were saying, what you were doing wasn't important. You're hurting their client. The fossil fuel industry um, is who he was talking about. And, and they're going to come after you because you're hurting their client. Understand it's not personal. Um, it, it's about the impact that you're having. And that was important to me. It allowed me to sort of view this, I suppose, you know, um, philosophically and to sort of remove myself and my own emotions from it to an extent, um, to see it as part of something larger. Uh, and, and, and I was able to do that because I had some, some good tutelage um, from more senior scientists. Today, I like to think that um, I can share those sorts of lessons, hard learned lessons um, with, with younger scientists today who are coming up through the ranks. Um, so it's sort of a shifting of generations now. You talk in your book about a, you know, the kind of shoot the messenger approach, which um, industry that wants to maintain the status quo from tobacco to pesticides, you know, et cetera. We've seen this over and over again, and that we're seeing it today with the attacks on, for example, Greta Thunberg. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're still not leaving Rachel Carson alone. She, she's not allowed to, to rest in her grave. They're still going after her um, because of the impact, the huge impact that lives on um, in the legacy. Um, and to make an example, uh, right? Um, if you too speak up, we're going to come after you. That's the message that they want to send to other scientists and other would-be communicators. Um, I suppose to, to me, it, it didn't matter. I guess part of my I don't know, 
person, my, my personality. Um, uh, I always hated bullies and I would stand up to them when I was in grade school, even knowing that I'd get beaten up because it, it was just the right thing to do. And so mm -hmm. I guess that prepared me well for this, this role that I'm playing where I'm dealing with some pretty powerful bullies, um, but I'm not gonna let them you know, get away with what they're doing. I'm gonna call them out um, because it's the right thing to do. And I think there are enough scientists today um, and I think in part because of the, you know, who have grown up in the world of social media, uh, where there's now a direct on ramp, uh, on -ramp to uh, engagement, you know, so it's everybody can be part of the conversation. And younger scientists today are, are so much more engaged um, and, 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 and recognize that, that ultimately um, their role can go beyond doing the science and, and making sure that, you know, our public discourse is informed by objective science and there's just so much more engagement on the part of young scientists today that that gives me that's one of those reasons again that i have optimism i think one of the most important things to remember too is that is how much support um, the idea that we need to take action now to mitigate climate change has i mean you you talk about it in, in your book how it, it's the um the fossil fuel industry would like people to think that there's not that much support. Right. Um, but in fact, you know, certainly we've seen it in Canada in the polls, yep. even in Alberta, there is strong support and recognition that climate change is happening, that it's human caused, that that we need uh, to move quickly, that we need to phase out fossil fuels. I mean, there's disagreements between, say, people who live in Quebec and people who live in Alberta, how quickly it's going to be. But right. in fact, <laughs> often we sit here thinking we're alone when we're attacked, but actually now that people can see the floods and the fires and the impacts, um, the debate is, is over. No, that's right. And, and you see this in American politics, uh, the polarization when it comes to um, sort of opinion leaders, uh, to influencers versus where the public is. The public overwhelmingly supports common sense uh, gun reform, and yet you can't get a single Republican um, in Congress to support it. Um, and it's because the the forces of inaction, uh, the vested interests, dark money organizations, the Koch brothers, uh, the power brokers in the conservative movement realize they no longer need the people to be with them. If they can gerrymander our Congress and, and elect, um, you know, uh, term after term, their preferred candidates, they can get the policies they want, even if the public isn't behind them anymore. And we see that uh, with climate change, where I think it's something like 60% in the latest polling of Republicans under the age of 40 think we have to be doing much more about climate change. That's the Republican Party. And so there's this huge disconnect now between where the people are and where our politicians are. I, I think ultimately that's an unstable situation. It will change. And that's where activism and voting and organizing and all these other things come in. We have to make sure that our politics reflect where we are as a society, because if we can do that, we can tackle these problems. Oh my gosh, we just had a flood of more questions and we only have two more minutes. I'm just gonna look and see if there's a couple of quick ones um, that we can bring in. I don't know if this is quick, but there's a clarification question. You earlier said we need to bring down our carbon emissions by a factor of two. And yeah. there's a couple of questions online. What exactly does that mean? If that went by too quickly for some people. Sure thing, yeah. So uh, we've got to bring them down by roughly 7% a year for the next 10 years. And if we do that, they'll, they'll be down 50% a, a decade from now. 7%, here's the good news. That's what they came down by this last year. The bad news, much of that was from the response to the pandemic, social distancing, lockdowns, uh, economic slowdown, less transportation. So what it shows is we can do that, but we're not going to get another 7% year after year by just changing our lifestyles, our behavior. What it points to is the need for a systemic solution. We really do need to decarbonize the system and we've got to do so quickly. We've got to bring those carbon emissions down 7% a year for the next 10 years. And if we do that, we're down a factor of two a decade from now. And if we continue on, we're down to zero by 2050, which is where we need to be. Michael Mann, some lot. Can you leave us with a final thought of what you think our listeners should do? You had so many great parts in the book. Four point plan. You know, uh, yeah. <laughs> disregard the doomsayers. Child shall lead them. 
I'm a person listening tonight and, and what should I do? I'm going to leave it with my tagline, which is urgency and agency. There is great urgency. We have to act now. There is agency. We can do it. This is our moment. Let's do it. Thank you so much. You are you. such an inspiration. Um, uh, your resiliency and also your courage. And courage well, is contagious. And that's what I'm we inspired need. By, by you too, uh, Zipporah. So it was a pleasure to do this with you. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. And special thanks to the Ottawa Public Library and the Ottawa International Writers Festival. Same time next week. Great follow-up conversation. Don't miss Seth Klein with his amazing book, A Good War. Um, which will help deepen this conversation on what we need to do in Canada. Have a great evening. Stay safe. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.